Now we want to shift our focus to the main reason why we do what we do, and that is to advance the rule of law. So next up, we will be hearing from three guest speakers who have played and continue to play key roles in the advancement of the judiciary in their respective countries, also by implementing technology. We have Tan Sri Dato Sri Richard Malanju, former Chief Justice of Malaysia. We are also joined by Dorothy Nui So, Director General of the Jud Judicial Supervisory Department of the Myanmar Supreme Court. And finally, we have Justice Jose Midas P. Marquez, Court Administrator of the Supreme Court of the Philippines. This session will be aptly moderated by Hannah Lim, our Head of Rule of Law and Emerging Markets. Don't forget to put your burning questions in the Q&A box. Over to you, Hannah. Thank you so very much, Derek and Melissa, and, and welcome everyone to our Rule of Law panel on technology and judiciaries. And first, I want to echo what Melissa said. The reason why we do what we do and why anyone participates in the legal industry is ultimately to ensure access to justice and to uphold the rule of law. So first, I'd like to thank from the bottom of my heart, our esteemed speakers, Dao Tin Wei So from the Myanmar Supreme Court, Tantri Richard Malanjun, who is former Chief Justice of Malaysia, and of course, Justice Marquez, who is Court Administrator of the Supreme Court of the Philippines. Now, each of our speakers are either current or past leaders of technology, a technology adoption in their courts of their jurisdiction. And we are very, very excited to hear their perspectives today. So may I ask for um, Tanshree Richard Malanjun and uh, Justice Marquez to please turn on your cameras and then we can get started. Thank you very much. You may also um, unmute your microphones. Okay. Um, so I guess my first question is for Tanshree Richard Malanjun. Um, Tantri Mitchell Ranjun, Sabah and Sarah Wak are early adopters of technology in the judiciary, and you were at one point the Chief Justice of Sabah and Sarah Wak as well. May I ask what prompted the Sabah and Sarah Wak courts to do so? And could you share a little bit of what was that journey like? Uh, can I be heard? Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you, but we can't see you. Yeah, I'm trying to work on the <laughs> on, the, uh, on the video because this I was in, but something went wrong. No uh, worries. Yeah, uh, give me about a minute. Sure, sure, no problem. Yeah. I mean, yeah. the, this is what technology brings with us. <laughs> <laughs> you have the good and the bad, <laughs> but it's okay. We can always overcome the difficulties. One minute. No problem. All right. Ah, now we see now? you. Yeah. Oh. Right. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, thank you. Yeah. Hello, my guest. Yeah, right. Uh, my turn to uh, answer the question, is it? Yes, please. Yeah. Okay. Uh, first of all, thank you very much for Lex Nexus for inviting uh, me to this webinar. Yeah, and it's a pleasure to see all friends like uh, Marcus and and of course uh, everybody in Lexis Nexus. Yeah. Uh, uh, long time, uh, Richard. <laughs> yeah, that was a long time. <laughs> How are you doing? Okay. Anyway, uh, for Sabah and Sarawak, uh, I would say this. It's always the saying that the next city is a matter of invention. So <clears throat> due to the remoteness of the place, and at uh, that time in 1996, 97, uh, I was posted in this quite uh, remote place called Sandakan. And uh, there, uh, I was heading the court there for the first time, and I realized the inefficiency of the manual system. Everything uh, has to be done manually, had to be done manually, and uh, including the cost list and the scheduling of cases and so forth. And at that time, I think uh, in 1990s, uh, technology was just growing up, uh, not in the 80s, yeah? and uh, we have uh, new application, a third-party application being done. So <clears throat> I started with very simple uh, requirement, and that is to digitalize first the pending cases. Uh, I realized that to do searches in, in a manual, you know, that takes so long. Uh, so there were the main reason, therefore, we went in is to boost efficiency uh, and to make life easier for everybody. And on top of that, to also reduce manpower. Because manually, there would have been two or three fellows to do job 
to be done by uh, computer which can be done uh, easily and efficiently. So we started with digitalizing uh, the pending cases first. That's what we call in Malaysia the cost list, you know, a cost book rather. And uh, having done that, it would be easier for us to monitor. And, uh, and that we can easily use uh, Word, Microsoft Word, you know, at that point. And uh, later on, the other, the other weakness of the system that I saw at the time was the collection of evidence during a trial. Everything was handwritten. And can you imagine a uh, witness in the witness box and the judge have to write whatever he says and whatever the lawyers ask. And that's very tedious, very tiring, and very slow. So we wanted to expedite as well the recording of the evidence. So there were two main things that uh, we started. It was a baby step, I must say. And uh, after about after we have implemented that, I realized that things were doing quite okay. Uh, things went faster, especially the recording of the evidence, because we immediately got that into uh, into the computer, yeah, and uh, the scheduling of the cases. From there, we don't have to go and look for the hard copy files. We can get it from the online on uh, in that. That was the baby step, and from there onward, I we progress on uh, until this time as uh, we develop further. But it was for efficiency necessity that uh, we prompted us to go into the computerization. Thank you so much, Tantri. I thought it was very insightful. Mm. I think it's it's nice to know that we all share the same concerns, right? As mm -hmm. much as lawyers want to be more efficient, the judiciary mm -hmm. also, you know, has that um, sort of like desire and, and that need to also improve its efficiency. So now maybe I'd like to ask Dr. Nui So from the Myanmar perspective, um, the technology journey is perhaps a little bit more recent from um, when Myanmar started. So my question is when, how, and why did the Myanmar courts decide to consider using technology? And, and what were some of the initial responses and concerns from the Myanmar judiciary? Thank you, Hana. So Minglava, auspiciousness to you all. So, so it's my first time to share our experience in the <coughs> technology in the region. So, so we are very, we started very recently the disco technology journey. So we can say that it starts from the 2050. It's a, too late in the region. So as the, our first three-year judicial strategy plan. And so we established a new ID department at the Supreme Court and we plan to improve the IP capacity at the Supreme Court at first. And then we created the network connection with the Supreme Court and 14 states and regional high courts. And we developed a the administrative functions of the Supreme Court. So, and also the, we enhance the court community information through the, our website. Secondly, we tested the automated case management program in two pilot codes. So that programs provide a modern database program, including or code scheduling, detailed case tracking, and automated code forms and management report to support the case management program at the different levels of codes. So at that time, it's a very initial stage. And so at that time, the responses are came from the code administrators and code staff. So they were very reluctant to use the computer at that time. So our second phase start from the 2018 under the second five-year judicial strategy plan. So at that time, we adopted the ID master plan for the entire judiciary. And we upgrade the, our website as web portal. So this second phase, we more use the technology for the code and community relations. So, all the code business like a cost list, order list of the high codes and supreme codes, 
and also court rulings, judgments are available at our website and also the social media of the public relations department of the Supreme Court. So the court users are very welcome. They can accessible the court information easily. So the currently we make a, a lot of development in the code technology because of the pandemic situation. It drives us to use more code technology for the code daily business. So we promote the use of technology, the our administ code administrative, like our holding the conference, meeting, trainings, and so advocateship admission ceremony, so through the video conference. And also the daily code business like uh, uh, different levels of the code, they use the video technology for the remote remaining adjournment and appellate codes as well as the Supreme Code. We hear remotely by the over the video conference. So in this phase, the code user were involved in the use of the technology, not only the code staff and judges. So, but we used this technology very recently, you know, before the end of the 2020. So our survey is uh, too short, but they are code users, they are concerned the accessibility of the technology. We can see it, but we should need a more time to identify the real cause. What's the problem from the code user side? So this is the our situation and how we start. And so now what we are working and using technology. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Nui. So yeah, I have to say, having worked with your team and with the IT department of the Supreme Court and the e-government department, um, I'm very, very impressed at how committed, resilient, and resourceful the team is. And I can really, really see in such a short time that so much can be done. So, you know, it's never too late. And I'm really, really yeah. glad that we get to be with the Myanmar courts on this journey. Um, so now Thank I'd you. like to ask Justice Marquez, um, when it came to technology adoption for the Philippine judiciary, where did you and the courts look to for inspiration? And, and I ask because, you know, courts are unique um, institutions with unique concerns and considerations. So, you know, what were your guiding principles when it came to your technology journey? Oh, thank you, Hannah. And, uh... Uh, good morning to everyone. Thank you for uh, inviting me to uh, give me this opportunity to share our experiences here in the Philippines. Well, uh, to answer your questions, uh, there are different types or phases of uh, court technology. No? Automation of court management and processes, digitization of court records, electronic transmission of pleadings and records, video conferencing hearings, and a lot more. No? Uh, as early as um, 11 or 12 years ago, uh, the Philippine judiciary already uh, commissioned the development of what we now call the Enterprise Information Systems Plan no? or EISP. Um, it is a comprehensive court automation reform program. Uh, this was actually formulated by a Spanish firm. Uh, and then uh, sometime in 2014, uh, I was part, I was uh, fortunate to be a part of a study tour which visit, visited the courts in uh, Bosnia, Herzegovina, no? to, to learn how they automated their court management and processes. Then in uh, 2015, I don't know if uh, Richard remembers this, uh, we met in, uh, in the ASEAN Chief Justices meeting in Boracay. No? And uh, we discussed at length how uh, they automated their court processes and how great it was working. It was uh, very impressive. No? Uh, from his uh, tablet in Boracay, he could see his courts in Saba, their caseloads, the status of the cases. No? It is really very impressive. And, uh, and after that, we still, uh, we still uh, got in touch and uh, we continued no? our uh, correspondence. No? Uh, 
Then for uh, video conferencing hearings, well, we have uh, act, uh, because of that, no, uh, we 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 came up with our uh, own version of uh, uh, automating our court processes and management. No, so uh, we are that is uh, that is up to now being uh, being um, I would say uh, completed no? or finalized. No? Then for uh, video conferencing hearings, which uh, we have fully uh, implemented, we look to Australia and the United States for um, inspiration. No? Uh, in Australia, we saw how their uh, high security prisons and courts were equipped with the uh, video conferencing technology to minimize, if not totally eliminate the risks involved in uh, transporting inmates or persons deprived of liberty, PDLs, as we call them here in the Philippines. No? We then cited U.S. jurisprudence as the Philippine Constitution is heavily influenced by the American Constitution in our newly released guidelines on video conferencing. Hence, we made sure that the constitutional rights of the accused will be protected and upheld at all times. We actually first pilot tested video conferencing hearings in one city a few months before the pandemic hit. However, with the advent of COVID-19, and the imposition of community quarantines, we had to immediately adjust and expand the use of video conferencing hearings to all stages of civil and criminal cases in all our courts nationwide. The guiding principles have always been to make our courts more efficient, effective, and responsive to the changing times. Of course, without sacrificing adherence to the rule of law and the dispensing of fair and impartial justice. Thank you, Justice Marquez. That's very inspiring. And I'm particularly struck by the importance of judicial networks. Um, it seems pretty clear that, um, you know, having visited other courts, spoken with other courts who are also going through the same process, there's definitely a lot that judges can learn from each other and to improve their own journey. So I think it's very inspiring to hear how our communities are working together to improve justice across the globe. So, from that perspective of the judiciary, I now like to talk a little bit about lawyers and interfacing with court technology. So, what should lawyers in each of your courts expect when it comes to the technology that you have, and and how should they be preparing themselves? Perhaps I can start with um, Dotinwe So, again. Thank you. So. We can say that traditionally some Yama people, especially senior people, they don't want to pay attention on the technology. You know, so for the use of the court technology, the Supreme Court, we issue the notification and announcement for the remote hearing in advance. And also we allow the this remote hearing is a uh, optional. So lawyers and the parties, they can choose whether they were apply the remote hearing or they wait the in-person hearing when we can make it. So <laughs> it's the current situation. As a, even a short time survey, the lawyers and the party apply for the remote hearing is in 80% of the criminal cases and only 50% of the civil cases. It means the lawyer, they still reluctant to use the technology for the hearings, but it's, uh, we need more time to identify the, this issue. So I think the lawyers, they should pay attention on the changes of the code technology and they should follow the new code practices and they try to familiar with the technology for the efficient process. So it's my view. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Nui. So um, perhaps Tanji Richard Malanjun, maybe you'd like to share a little bit about that for lawyers in Malaysia? Yes. Uh, I realized from uh, this uh, journey of computerization, the lawyers is, uh, they are very, very important component in the development. You leave them out, you are in trouble. So we started right from the day one to get them in into a task force or in the committees. And every decision, every step of the way, there'll be discussion with them and also feedback from them. 
uh, what they want and all that. And I must say this, you know, in the beginning, especially the senior ones, resistance was very strong because uh, people don't normally change you know, for the sake of uh, new things. So, but it was through persuasion. And uh, the other thing that I would say that really pushed them is this, uh, because they realized of the efficiency and on top of that, uh, removal of any delays in returning their documents. That seems to have uh, really impressed them uh, to the extent, therefore, that they, they, they realize that it's good to adapt. And, uh, but sadly to say that the senior ones in practice before, they have to give up their practice because they are just not willing to uh, uh, relearn on the new technology. And so quite a number of them gave up practice, sadly. Very sad, in fact. But uh, I guess that's how life is. And uh, the others joined in and, uh, and, uh, and participated. And, uh, and that also included the judges. It's not only the lawyers, the judges and the lawyers, they have to work together to make any system work. And otherwise, it will not, it will not work. So that's my experience with the lawyers. It's a matter of gentle persuasion. In a way, I would say it's a carrot and stick kind of uh, uh, approach. You, know? uh, you can't also wait for them forever because they will try to postpone things or delay things as long as possible. So the top man must come down hard to say, look, this is the cut of point. Let's start from here. You'll be surprised uh, how fast they adapt after that, you know. Sheer in the city, they will adapt. And of course, we must provide training for them, the lawyers. We arrange for teamwork to uh, team groups, you know, to 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 to, to uh, go to the offices to train them on how the system should work. And because of that, once you facilitate that, it will improve a lot uh, to, for the, uh, in terms of cooperation. So that's our experience in dealing with the lawyers. As for the judges, the same thing applies. Uh, some are very scared of computers. So as I said, the team had to approach them, uh, coax them to uh, uh, join in and uh, show them the advantages. And, uh, and that's it. And when they realize it, it's not that difficult. Uh, you know, so bit by bit, they get involved in it and some get hooked into it, right? So, so much so now the lawyers today in Malaysia, if you pull off, pull uh, the system off uh, from, the, from the court system, there might be a riot, you know, because uh, they can't work. They can't work. And uh, that is one big development that I would say. And even uh, with this pandemic going on, Luckily that we have the system in place. Otherwise, the uh, thing would have stand, uh, stood still yeah? uh, because of the problems of uh, assess, uh, mon uh, movement control. So on, uh, because of the system, many cases, uh, especially civil, uh, can be managed remotely uh, to the extent maybe from the bedroom of the lawyers, you know, they, can, they can manage the cases. And that's, of course, uh, very, very convenient for everybody. And, uh, of course, for hearing with the uh, uh, existence of Zoom and all that, we used to have our video conferencing, but uh, with the emergence of Zoom and uh, so many other apps that uh, things get easier, much, much easier today uh, as compared to your own uh, uh, system of video conferencing. And of course, the other important thing which has always been overlooked is this, you know, the government or the techno companies must get involved. If they don't get involved, we are going to have a problem, especially for network. You must have a good network. Otherwise, you are wasting your time. And uh, <clears throat> that's the, our early experience on this, you know, because uh, network was quite poor. And even though our system was web-based, uh, the connectivity was quite poor. Uh, lucky now that uh, things have improved and we don't have so much a problem now in terms of connectivity. Yeah? So that is one of those things that uh, we need to look at. Thank you.
Thank you, Tanji Richamalamjian. I always enjoy hearing your stories about this journey, and, and it's also very, very interesting to hear about the importance of, you know, outside the court issues, like sort of infrastructure and network. So that's very interesting. Um, Justice Marquez, over to you. I'd be very interested to hear about the interface between the court technology and the lawyers in the Philippines. Well, uh, I agree with uh, Richard. No? Uh, we really had to uh, uh, get the lawyers involved no? in, uh, in the Philippines. They really had to familiarize themselves with the platforms and applications being used by the courts. No? We have supplied our courts with a particular platform uh, also for uh, security reasons. No? So uh, uh, I, our uh, courts have uh, uniform platforms. No? Uh, the lawyers should also have the necessary equipment for uh, video conferencing hearings and electronic transmission of pleadings, records, and orders. No? Um, of, of course, uh, <clears throat> because of the and, and, but uh, once uh, they they became used to it, uh, nobody wanted to attend in court hearings anymore. No, they just wanted to appear from their own uh, residences and maybe uh, uh, law firms or offices. No. Uh, uh, but you know, <clears throat> and, but uh, we have to. So we had to make sure no, that uh, when they appear uh, remotely, uh, they must also conduct themselves uh, properly, no, in the same manner as they would when they attend in court hearings. No, uh, they may. They must also, while uh, appearing remotely, they must likewise be in appropriate business attire. No? So as uh, what uh, Richard was saying earlier. They can manage their cases from their bedrooms or appear uh, from their bedrooms, but they have to be in suits, uh, well, even if they are in their bedrooms. Huh? Incidentally, we also allow the public to observe our uh, video conferencing hearings huh? because um, all our court hearings, save for a few exceptions, are public hearings. Huh? So those who would like to attend online hearings must, like the lawyers, conduct themselves properly and dress appropriately. You know? So uh, that has been a very good experience with our lawyers. Uh, now we have to uh, really, we have uh, given our courts the discretion you know, whether to allow the lawyers to appear remotely or to direct them or order them, or them, order them to appear uh, in court for uh, their hearings. Thank you, Justice Marquez. So it's interesting. It almost sounds like technology is another, I guess, procedural um, question that the court now has jurisdiction to, um, you know, decide over. So I think it's just an expansion of current processes to include new ways of upholding justice. Um, I was actually very struck by how similar the process can be to, um, you know, what we sometimes do when we call customer discovery initiative, our CDI, when we really try to understand what is it that, you know, the legal population needs, like how do they interact? Um, Dante Nuiso used to talk a lot about how we need to take more time to understand the issue. And, and, and that's absolutely correct, you know, trying to understand what is it that's really stopping people from adopting technology and how can we help them? Um, so, you know, we're always partners and, and happy to support the courts in this journey. And, um, you know, we really hope for opportunities to be able to do so. But now I want to really focus the questions on justice, right? So, Dr. Henry, so, um, you know, now that you've sort of had this experience with technology in the courts, can I ask, what are some of the more pressing concerns and considerations about justice in Myanmar? And how do you think technology can help to address these concerns? So, I think the layer of the court process is the common concern in Myanmar, you know? So, especially in the current pandemic situation. So there are many restrictive orders from the state and region government and central government, because in our country, the outbreak area is a very different. So in some areas, the courts can run as a normal and they can continue the hearing in person, but some area is a very difficult to, to do it. So, Mostly the, the court, they can continue the hearing for the uh, essential and urgent cases and some pandemic offenses, you know, a lot of the violations of the 
regional orders from the, the preventive measures. So I think the technology is the only way to overcome the, these restrictions. So we could uh, wait the, the every, all the situation as a normal. And so we couldn't wait for the court operation. So, because it will really defect the rights of the people. So I think it's a good time and right time to we promote the use of the technology. And so maybe there are some issues and problems as a technical error by using the, this matter and now not the skillful the people is use it, but I think it's the only way to overcome the, this issue. Thank you, Dr. Nueso, for that perspective. Yeah, definitely. Um, you know, it's it's a terrible time now with the pandemic going on, and 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 we're we're very concerned for our friends who um, have to suffer through this. Um, but at the same time, we do see opportunities and we're really trying to make the best of it. Um, so congratulations to the courts for making the mm -hmm. best of the situation. Um, focusing on justice, and when we talk about technology and justice, we always have to talk about the digital divide. You know, people who have technology, people who can use technology versus people who don't have that kind of access. So um, Tantri Richard Melanjun, with your work in establishing, you know, the mobile courts in East Malaysia, you are extremely familiar, I'm sure, with the difficulties faced by communities that have limited access to internet and technology. So how do you think our justice systems need to evolve to bridge this gap, you know, especially in terms of justice and the rule of law? What, what should we be doing? Uh, <clears throat> I must say that uh, initially, a lot of question marks were being posed on the use of technology and justice. They are saying that uh, justice will be compromised uh, due to the use on, of technology. But uh, times have proven that that, is, that, that uh, perception is wrong. Yeah? Uh, <clears throat> take, for instance, in our areas where certain areas are very, very remote, where there is no connectivity uh, and so forth, and people still need justice there. And uh, justice is not in the way of uh, liability or guilty or whatever, you know. Simple thing as getting birth certificate or getting the document uh, registered and so forth, making a statute declaration and so forth. These two, the rural folks, it's actually it's justice, yeah? Uh, uh, what to do with the, the land applications and so forth. Uh, or they get injured and what do they do next? These are simple advice to us from those from urban, but to them, it's a big, big headache. And uh, with the introduction of the mobile court that and we did that in East Malaysia, Sabah and Sarawak, uh, we realized that uh, uh, justice must be brought to the rural folks. Don't wait for them to come. Now, the next challenge, of course, is how do you bring justice to them? Uh, you can't uplift the court and uh, court buildings and bring it to the rural areas, right? So it has to be mobile. And But then you may have a mobile court, you set up a courtroom in the interior, but you can't connect to the headquarters, what's the point? That is where technology came in. That's where the technology came in and uh, assisted us. Uh, in that uh, we could use the, the technology to link, even though you're in the remote areas, to be able to link to the central base for us to get uh, retrieve for the data and all that and to proceed, even though we are in the remote areas. Uh, thank, of course, to uh, uh, the, the <coughs> extens, uh, extensive uh, network now that is uh, prevailing. And... Uh, these people in the rural areas, they don't have access to computer and so forth, right? So, uh, but when we go there and you serve them, they realize how important it is, yeah, that uh, they have uh, access to the courts, access to justice. And uh, you'll be surprised uh, how happy they can, uh, they would feel, yeah? Uh, take for example, I will just share with you one very sad story whereby uh, we have a teacher who, who worked for years as a teacher 
and it's just because he did not have a proper documentation on his birth certificate. He, after he retired, he couldn't get his pension because the authorities turned around and says, look, uh, you don't have all these papers and therefore we can't pay you a pension. Can you imagine how you feel if you are in the rural areas? So we went to the mobile court, went to the areas and he approached us and uh, and we said, look, this document is it for us to, to get it done, regularized for you. And uh, we managed to regularize for him. And within a month or so, he was already receiving his pension. So there you are. That is what we call justice. And also some children couldn't go to school. They couldn't even go up to higher secondary school because they don't have birth certificates. These are what the biggest challenge we have actually in the rural areas, you know, having a uh, certification uh, of, of birth. So the primary functions of the mobile court therefore was to, or is to uh, arrange, facilitate the, 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 the preparation and the certification of their birth, yeah? And uh, because of that, many of them now can go to school because the document has been properly done or regulated. And same thing with marriages. A lot of uh, rural marriages sometimes is a problem because authorities may not even recognize that. And that is where the mobile court will give them advice and so forth. And uh, <clears throat> well, how do technology come in? You may ask, because that can be done uh, manually. Not necessarily, you know, because uh, uh, once we see them and we see a problem, we can relay that the problem uh, almost instantaneously to the authorities' concern via the, the, the system. And uh, of course, we get back the answer as well, as quickly as uh, it is. So <clears throat> there you are. Uh, the divide is still there, uh, techno divide is still there, but it can be narrowed uh, if you are, uh, you know, if you really think out of the box and uh, will use it to the maximum. And uh, that, from my experience, is one beautiful thing about that technology. You couldn't have done it if manually, you know, it would have taken months or even years possibly. Uh, so, so that is one big advantage that I, 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 I realized personally on, on the benefit of technology uh, to be used by the courts. Thank, Thank you. you so much, Tanshi Richard Malanjo. That was very inspiring to hear. And I mean, a few takeaways that I got from that, the importance of bringing justice to the people and not waiting for people to come, you know, to you. And also, um, you know, being creative when it comes to the use of technology because justice delayed is justice denied. Okay, and so with that, can I turn now to Justice Marquez? Um, I'd love to hear the experience um, from the Philippines, you know, being an archipelagic nation. It's a very, very unique geographical circumstance. And I don't think there are many discussions um, around such a unique context here in Southeast Asia. So what are some of the justice concerns relating to technology and the courts that, that you've had to deal with? Well, uh, you're correct, Hannah, no? that uh, court technology is really the way to go for an archipelagic nation like the Philippines. No? But of course, uh, we have uh, some concerns as well. No? Well, the number one concern would be infrastructure. No? There are courts in uh, far-flung areas where internet connectivity is really a problem. Uh, and then, of course, the quality of connectivity available also makes it difficult to... Uh, conduct, say, uh, video conferencing hearings. No? Uh, as a result, these hearings uh, need to be rescheduled, uh, causing delay in the proceedings. No? In the last eight months that we've had, uh, we've um, implemented video conferencing hearings, we've had a total of around 170,000 video conferencing hearings with a success rate of 80%. Uh, <clears throat> and then, of course, uh, another concern would be uh, for, for video conferencing hearings would be the equipment being used by those attending video conferencing hearings. So, uh, ideally, the courts must make sure that those attending remotely from their residences, especially the witnesses, no, can be seen clearly, uh, their demeanor and candor, candor uh, can be observed, their voices can be heard very well. No? The courts should also uh, make sure that uh, these witnesses are not being coached no, while attending uh, remotely. No? So these are some of the concerns uh, for uh, when we do uh, video conferencing hearings. No? But uh, we continue no? We continue to address these concerns. No? 
Uh, but uh, because of the pandemic, we just had to uh, right away um, uh, implement some of these measures so that our courts will continue to uh, dispense uh, justice and uh, resolve those cases pending before them. Thank you, Justice Marquez. Yeah, I can I certainly imagine that, um, you know, coming from Singapore, it, it's a very different context, right? Like, you know, I'm such a small country, it's quite easy to implement across the board, I imagine. Um, it would be very, very different in different contexts. Um, I, I have a quick question, actually, from, from the public. I think they're looking for clarification. Um, the video cam that is available for the public, that, that does not show the public watching, right? It's just the lawyers and the um, witnesses. Um, so there's no concern about, you know, how the public is dressed when they are attending. That's only for the lawyers, right? Oh, no. Uh, when, when, we, when, when the public uh, is allowed to observe our video conferencing hearings, they were, uh, their faces will appear oh. in the tiles as well. No, so they will be seen. They will be seen. Uh, in in fact, uh, we have uh, we have um, rules no, that uh, when they appear uh, or when they uh, observe hearings, they should also uh, uh, conduct themselves uh, properly. No, uh, they cannot uh, they cannot um, interfere in the court proceedings, or otherwise uh, they will uh, face uh, mm. contempt proceedings. No, so they will have to. Uh, conduct themselves properly and uh, dress uh, appropriately as well. Okay, that's very interesting. Thank you. Uh, I've got another question related to this topic on, you know, justice and the digital divide. Um, so, you know, for all the panelists, we do see a global trend of courts embracing online hearings. Do you think this, on balance, improves overall access of justice when it comes to the general population? Or will it further exacerbate the gap between the rich and the poor, people who can't afford technology and people who can't afford technology? Um, maybe Justice Marquez, what are your thoughts on that? I don't think so, no, because uh, as we move forward, technology becomes cheaper. No? So before, only a few can, uh, can afford to have smartphones. Now even uh, the marginalized have their own uh, smartphones. No? Uh, in fact, uh, if let's say the, 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 the hearing is not very, uh, um, I'd say, uh, important, where uh, uh, well, uh, the, the lawyers will just be arguing certain uh, points of law, then uh, they can, they can uh, use their smartphones in attending those hearings. No? So I don't think that um, technology you know, will widen the gap between the rich and the poor. I think uh, um, technology will really play a very important role later on in bridging this, uh, this gap and uh, in making our courts more accessible to everyone. That's great to hear, Justice Marquez. Um, maybe I can ask the same question to Tanshri Richard Malanjun. Do you think um, this trend of online hearings is in Malaysia, is it going to improve the you know, rich poor divide, the digital divide when it comes to justice, or do you think it might make it worse? I think it will improve. Uh, uh, with, with the introduction of uh, online hearing and so forth, uh, you don't have to worry anymore about uh, getting delays and all that, especially from those fellows from the rural areas, uh, they don't have to worry about uh, uh, unable to attend due to uh, financial constraint and so forth. If they can get it online, they don't have to worry about that. They can, they can be heard by the court. So that's one improvement I would say. Uh, for instance, as well, uh, uh, even delays can be prevented, uh, such as witnesses may not be available on that day if you have to attend the court. But if you can be allowed to testify online, and that will save the day. So you see that will improve a lot in terms of the quality of justice and the speed of justice. And the other thing, of course, is this here. Uh, transparency in the court processes is, more, is, is, uh, is also, has also been enhanced in a way that, for instance, uh, in, uh, in Malaysia, we have, uh, especially Sabah and Sarawak, we put in what we call a monitoring system. Monitoring system is such that uh, uh, not only as to the movement of the cases being monitored by the system automatically, you know, nothing to do with uh, the big boss, the big brother watching, 
the system will be the big brother. And if there's a delay in the return of the document, the system will trigger a reminder. If there's a delay in the return of judgment, the system will trigger reminders. And it will be extended copies to the bosses. So can you imagine if you're a judge and you're supposed to write a judgment, and suddenly a red alert appears on the screen, you'll be shivering, isn't it? That you did not do your job. So you see, the technology has, uh, has, has speed up. And I said just now also improve the quality of justice. And to that, it is there is no, it doesn't matter whether somebody is rich or poor, yeah, uh, because uh, everybody has a fair share. And, uh, and that makes us all the system more transparent. Uh, there is no more question of, oh, he is rich, he can afford to pay a good lawyer and therefore he can get things done faster. No, 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 no. The system does not know who is rich, who is poor. Uh, if the judge is slow, there you are, the system will tell the fella, you better work. Otherwise, the big boss will whack you. So that kind of, uh, of, 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 of uh, system we've implemented, the monitoring, is very critical, I think, in any system that is being put in place here you know, for, for judiciary. There's no point to have a very good uh, case management system or, the, for that matter, the transcription system or whatever. If you don't have a component in your system, what we call a monitoring system, it will not function as well as, uh, as it should be. Yeah? Uh, and when you say monitoring, not only monitoring for the lawyers, monitoring for the staff, monitoring for the judges themselves. I know it sounds uh, like a slice, slave driver kind of uh, instrument, yeah? but uh, it is good. I, and I find it to be a very good uh, administrative tool when I was there. Uh, I don't have to worry because uh, the system will work for me. Instead of me getting a chief clerk to oversee all things, the system will oversee the smooth uh, movement of cases and so forth. So I think that one, I would strongly advise those who want to implement a system, make sure you have your monitoring system in place and make sure that it's being known by lawyers, by uh, judges, by staff. Oh, they're very scared with that. Yeah? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, Dr. Richard Malandrin. That was very, it's very interesting because ultimately what, what we're looking at here is transparency and accountability in an unbiased fashion. Um, so, I mean, it's very encouraging to hear how you think technology can, can support with that. Um, maybe I can ask Dr. Nui So, I mean, what, what do you think, Dr. Nui So, in terms of the technology divide in, in Myanmar? Do you think um, online hearings would make this divide worse or do you think it would improve it? Hi, Dr. Nueso, you might be on mute. Are you still with us? Okay, thank you. <laughs> so even at this conference, so we lost the internet access. <laughs> so, so the Supreme Court, we can support the uh, devices for the technology to decode. So with the, the, the how to so say, the, the government budget allow. So it's a problem. So we couldn't make uh, the whole countries and all code at the same time. We implement face by face and provide the devices and uh, other facility for the technology to the code. But the problem is from the side of the code user. So including the lawyers. So they will use their their own devices. So I think it's a, it's limit the access of the technology from the public as well as the lawyer. It may be issued. So I think we have to create and make a more opportunity to the code user. They can use their code technology and the they can access to the uh, online platform of the code for the code business. So this is my idea it's because I had uh, some experience from the Malaysia and Philippine, how they develop and how to encourage and persuade the 
outsider good user. So I think it's a very good lesson for us. And so I got a, a lot of idea how to improve the, our situation. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Nuiso. Now I'm going to move on to the last um, segment of our conversation. It's really the question of change leadership, courts as leaders in this domain. Um, and, and, you know, courts are the leaders of legal communities. And, you know, you can also be leaders in technology adoption for justice. So I'd like to hear your thoughts um, when it comes to, to leadership in the transformation process. What do you think is crucial to the success of effectively you know, adopting technology, not just in courts, but in the overall legal system? Maybe I can start with um, Justice Marquez. What are your thoughts on this? Oh, thank you, Hannah. Uh, yes, the courts will always be leaders no? because what the court says, the parties will have to follow. No? But uh, what if the litigants, no matter how they try, cannot comply? You know? Like in our uh, video conferencing hearings right now, as I mentioned earlier, our success rate is only is down actually to just 80%. It used to be 88 to 89% when we, when we first started. So uh, something must be done no? to, uh, to address this uh, issue. No? So... Uh, there must always be coordination and cooperation between the courts and the court users. The courts must always be open to, to new or better ways of uh, doing things, of course, with uh, some restraint. Uh, they must always uh, get feedback from the stakeholders to make the processes more effective and efficient. Um, I am actually um, reminded no, by the saying, uh, I am their leader, therefore I must follow them. So uh, I think there must this this be there must uh, this constant no, uh, coordination and cooperation between the courts and the court users for for all these to uh, succeed. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Justice Marquez. I think this ties in very nicely to Azira's question on, you know, what are some of the strategies that, you know, are used to ensure buy-in from governmental institutions? And I think, Justice Marquez, you talked about following the people that you lead, um, constant coordination and feedback. So I think that's very, very apt. Um, perhaps, Dr. Henry, so what are your thoughts on, on this question um, when it comes to leadership in transformation of the legal industry? Sorry, Dr. Henry, so you're on mute. You're still on mute. One more time? Okay. Yeah, it's okay. So for us, the technology adoption and transformation is uh, not an easy one. So at that stage, the good leadership is uh, very essential. And also the effective implementation is a big role for it. It's how much we can implement and it will how the people enjoy and satisfy the, this, our transformation and technology for the code user. So I think it will be involved in the many actors. So as the uh, Richard said, so I think the judges themselves, their desire and wish to use the technology is the first and so, also, we need the support of the government because internet infrastructures or some supporting is a very basic for us and all stakeholders in justice systems. So from the private sector, lawyers, and as well as the criminal cases, we will deal with the prison, uh, law office, public prosecutors, or so many actors, so they are also important and take part and we work together to improve the, our technology and to use it. So, so Hannah, you already know recently we finished the online publication of our commercial judgment project. So uh, with uh, Lexisness, is, it's a, a piece of the innovation for the court process, but it's a big changes for the Myanmar judges. They have to use the digital judgment template for writing a judgment. They will store and save the document and upload the, the judgment in the system. So I think it's a very good initiative because 
near future, we have uh, established the specialized code division for the intellectual property cases. So that division will be set up with the best practices and technology. So I think so our recent project is a very helpful and just shake to the, our judges to their process to use the technology. So that's why I think so to successful implementation of the technology issue, everybody is so involved in the, this area and their desire is very important with the leadership of our Union Chief Justice. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Inui. So it's very inspiring to hear. And actually, I have to say, I, I actually found the internet in Myanmar to be fantastic. You know, when I was a, a lawyer in, in Myanmar, I was hiking from Kalor to Inlay Lake while editing documents on my phone and sending them via the 4G MPT network. And it was fantastic. So I think, you know, definitely there's a very good infrastructure there that Myanmar can leapfrog from. And now I'd like to turn to um, Tanshi Richard Melanjan. What are your thoughts on courts as leaders for the legal community when it comes to technology implementation? And what are some of the strategies um, that you've used to ensure buy-in from other governmental institutions? Uh, <clears throat> this has always been a problem initially, yeah? uh, especially firstly between the courts and the lawyers, the users. Who should be on the, on the driver's seat? So it used to be uh, the users were in the driver's seat and the judges just sit in the back seat and wait for the system to flow. No, 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 we took over that. The courts now are the, on the driver's seat. That's very critical. But when you drive then, you got to provide uh, facilities for your passengers. And uh, we have done that. The rules have been uh, adapted to technology uh, in tune with technology, development of technology. Yeah? And we believe that leadership for the implementation of technology must be top down. You can't have it, you can't leave it to the staff, you can't leave it to the user alone. It has to be top down. Somebody at the top must decide and must push. If the person, person on the top, say within the court, if he just sit down and observe, no, it will not work. He has to come down, push it, and he himself must be interested in the system. He himself must know the system. He must be. Otherwise, he will just be a general without any skill in war, you know. So I think that's very important. Top down and getting involved. And of course, at the same time, you facilitate uh, the usage of the technology. There's no point just making orders if you don't facilitate for the users, yeah? So that's very important. And not only in, within the court system, the whole justice system, uh, the prison, the police, the prosecution and so forth. So it has to be that kind of uh, a network uh, created, yeah? So that uh, all parties are on the same page when it comes to the development of technology for the justice system. So <clears throat> again, I will say that until and unless uh, the court takes the lead, don't expect uh, technology to be of much use in the dispensation of justice yeah? in, in any country. That's my view. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you so much, Tanshi, Richard, Malanjun, and thank you to all our panelists for their very, very insightful comments and sharing a little glimpse of what we don't usually see, sort of the court's journey when it comes to technology. So I think this is very helpful in facilitating dialogue between the wider legal community and the institutions of justice. And unfortunately, we don't have time for all the many questions that are coming in. But um, I am inspired by the questions and plan actually maybe we can have a separate panel discussion on, you know, whether AI will make lawyers redundant and, you know, how can we train junior lawyers with technology coming about. These are very valid questions and I think it definitely warrants um, further focused discussion. So with that, I'd, I'd like to extend my sincere, extend my sincere thanks once again to Tanji Richard Melanjun, Dr. Meso, and Justice Marquez Thank for you. you know their valuable time here. Um, and with that, I'd like to hand the time back to the MCs to wrap up our conference. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.